Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and blessed, blessed be his, his kingdom, kingdom now, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, to you, you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what, the Lord, what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have, have mercy, mercy upon, upon us. Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. first lesson for today is uh, from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 56, verses 1 through 8, found on page 616 of the Pew Bible. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the Son of Man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that Hold fast my covenant. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord 
and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise, Praise be, be to God. God. The psalm for today is Psalm 67. It can be found on page 350 of your Book of Common Prayer, and we will read in unison. May God be merciful, merciful unto, unto us, us and, and bless us, us and, and show us the light of his countenance, and, and be merciful unto us. us. Let, Let your way be known upon earth. earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Indeed, let all the peoples praise you. O oh, let the nations rejoice and be glad. For you shall judge the peoples righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Then shall the earth bring forth her increase, and God, even our own God, shall give us his blessing. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the world shall fear him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The second reading for today is Romans chapter 11 verses 13 through 24, which can be found on page 947 of your pew Bibles. Now I am speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous, and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off, so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off before of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in the unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is nature, a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature, and a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? The word of the Lord. 
be to God. Let's stand together and turn in our hymnals to hymn number 461. district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But, she, but he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was, in, was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. And can I get, would someone be willing to pray for the message? Amen. So, most of you know, I'm a, I'm a chaplain uh, at the VA. I was a military chaplain for a while as well. Uh, and often I get people who come to me who want to talk about the hard things that they experience in life. Uh, and I wonder sometimes, because I know these people are part of bodies of believers, uh, I wonder if they come to me as a chaplain because they don't want to you know, out themselves in their own churches for doubts. Their struggles often cause them to doubt the love of Christ. Could be that they have a, maybe a distorted view of who God is and how he moves and acts in this world. They may have unknowingly become taught and brought into the prosperity gospel, uh, though they would never say so. Uh, that they believe in a Joel Olstein kind of approach to life, but they do seem to expect their best life now. But more so, I think, 
more. Uh, actually, are wondering what is God doing in this world? And they have had truly difficult lives in a deep, true sense. Childhood trauma, abuse, poverty, which is one of the reasons many of them leave their homes to go into the service to make a new start, to find a new way. And yet, of course, they experience hardship there as well, as we all do in life. As we live just a few minutes in life, we know that it is a hard world. They come to the chaplain and they ask that question, why? And I'm sure they come to you at times too. And they ask why? And they ask those, that why question that is so hard to really answer. Why is God doing this? I don't know. I don't know why he's doing it in your life. And so when I am brought, uh, when that person comes to me and asks that question, I'm honest. I, I don't know what's going, why God is doing this. But then I try to point them to the love of God. This moment that you're experiencing is so difficult and so hard and we don't understand it, but when we look to the cross of Christ, we know that God loves us, even in the midst of all those difficult, trying times and the whys that we have so often. He gave you his son. He loves you that much. Jesus gave up all his glory, his honor, the power do his name to become flesh and blood like you and me and take the wrath of the world and the Father so that we might be free of sin, that we might come to know the Father. This is, this is the quick version of that conversation, by the way. But the point is, I, 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 wanted to, I try to point them to the goodness of God in the act of redemption. Earlier in Matthew's Gospel, we read, uh, we hear Jesus saying, of which of you, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give you good things, give good things to those who ask him? You see, we do know that God gives us good things because he gave us Christ. He loves us perfectly in a way that earthly fathers are not able, even the ones who are good earthly fathers aren't able to love the way the Father does. The Father in heaven, excuse me, let me clarify that. And so when we come to this passage, we find this mother who is desperate, desperate for the healing of her daughter. And let's be more specific, her daughter is not just sick, but is oppressed by a demon. Those of us who have children who struggle with health issues, whatever those might be, understand a smidge of the desperation this woman is experiencing. But then to add an oppressive, demonic aspect to it, that would drive a loving parent to desperation, hopelessness. I've known parents who've gone to desperate means to have their children healed, uh, sometimes to even weird restrictive diets thinking that might cure them of whatever is going on. And so as people who love our children, we understand where this woman is coming from. We can identify with that, desperate to have relief provided for her child. Suffering is a true aspect of this life because we are in a sin-torn world. Suffering a mind, body, heart, and soul. And those of us who love people who struggle, and they're not just parents, but friends, other loved ones, we can feel that. We want to alleviate that suffering to a point that we might not even care for our own well-being. So our mother today, she is in that place. She's desperate, and she takes a risk in approaching Jesus for a couple reasons. First, she's a Canaanite an outsider, a dog in a nationalistic kind of way beneath a Jewish person. And she's a woman who in that time and era had no place in society. But in her desperation, she comes, she comes to Jesus for only hope, the only one she has left. She comes and falls at his feet, begging him, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. You see, word had spread even to her little town about who Jesus is. 
So she, she has some idea of who she, he is. He's not just any kind of Jewish rabbi. About three miles from this place uh, was a pagan temple to Eshmon, the Canaanite god of healing. And I would imagine for this woman who was a Canaanite, she would have gone there first. It's her own cultural way of doing it. But found no healing for her child. And so she seeks out in a desperate chance. She cries out to the only hope she has left. A last ditch effort, if you will. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Have you made a last ditch effort of crying out to God? Crying out as we make a plea to the Father, and he answers just as Jesus does in this passage. Silence and not a word. Silence is hard. It's a hard thing. You know, this story stood out to me a couple years ago when I was, I don't know what I was doing, if it was my morning prayers or what, but it just stood out to me. Because if we read, you know, the ministry of Jesus in this world and we're paying attention to how he does it, this passage, this interaction with this woman should seem like a shocker. Why aren't you answering her, Jesus? You have no problem teaching women. We've seen that. You have Mary and Martha who sit at your feet and learn are your disciples. So it can't be the fact that she's a woman. Oh my, my thing got turned upside down. Uh, somehow in the middle of it was my old sermon. And he doesn't seem to care about those cultural boundaries that separate people in that day. He interacts with Samaritans all the time. And he uses them as illustrations in his parables. He spoke to the woman at the well who was a Samaritan and a woman, a foreigner and a dog in the Jewish sense, yet he provided the water of life to her. And one of the great parables is that of the good Samaritan. So clearly Jesus has no issues with foreigners. And so for Jesus to be silent in this moment is strange. Which is all the reason we should pay more attention to what is going on here. It's out of character for him, so there must be something for us to learn. So often in life, we want a quick answer to our prayers. And God is able to do that. Oh, somebody got really loud. Amen. That's true. I mean, maybe I needed a boom there. God is able to do that uh, to make, but often he makes us wait. Waiting on God is a hard place, and we get put in it a lot. And as a result, we often begin to distrust promises. That's just the way we are wired as people. Waiting can seem like silence. And silence, and in silence, we quickly lose sight of the goodness of God. Paul Miller wrote in his book, A Praying Life, there's no such thing as a lament-free life. In fact, if your life is lament-free, you, are you aren't loving well. To love is to lament, to let your heart be broken by something. And later in his book, they, laments, bring together two things, reality and promise, that recoil from one another. A lament connects two hot wires, God's promise and the promise. And when that happens, sparks fly. I think some of us have worked on cars and other things and have touched two hot wires unintentionally, maybe. I blew out the fuses in our house before we moved here, and we had to call an electrician because I thought I could do it. But anyways, I got zapped pretty well. But the sparks fly when you cross those wires. And the, in a lament, we bring these two pr things together, promise and problem. But I like how Paul Miller says that. Lament brings together two hot wires, God's promise and the problem. As we look at this interaction between our Savior and this woman, we see just that. We find a mother in desperation turning to the last hope she has and laments crossing those hot wires. Let's take a look at this mother's interaction with our Savior again. So our Canaanite woman, she, she doesn't really know much about the Jewish faith. She doesn't know really who the son of David is. 
But she knows that Israel has a hope in the son of David. And she, in her desperation, turns to him to find that hope. And so she finds the actual son of David, and she pleads for her daughter. She brought the promise that she knew very little about, the promise that Israel has with the problem of her son, or excuse me, her daughter being oppressed by a demon. And she brings them to Jesus. And when his disciples, when Jesus doesn't answer, there's that silence. And then the disciples are like, can you send her away? Because she's, she's making a lot of noise. He doesn't speak to her yet, which also seems strange for Jesus. But he says to them, I came for the lost sheep of Israel, not for people like her. At least that's what it seems like he's saying. So, all right, Jesus, what's going on? That's what I, that's what I thought when I read this and noticed that. What's going on? You're speaking, to, you're speaking about her and that she's not part of your mission, but we know... We know well enough the Gentiles are brought into the church. And so what's up with that? But our Canaanite mother is not put off. As we watch this scene unfolds, we find her tenacity. She comes and she kneels at the feet of our Lord in submission to him. An act, by the way, that Israel, those lost sheep, seemed unable or unwilling to do. She kneels and simply says, Lord, help me. We know this cry. This cry in our lives, it may sound like, Lord, help me. It may be, Lord, save her. It may, Lord, heal him. Lord, redeem us. And now she's got him. She's, she's got his heart. It's going to melt. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. Oh, Jesus. Now you're calling names? Yes, Lord, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. All right, lady, let's not get snotty. This is Jesus. All right, now we're going to pause for a second. I think it's time for a little bit of a a biblical Greek lesson, which I don't do normally. One, because I'm not that good at biblical Greek. But it helps us understand the heart of this interaction here. To understand the last couple of verses, we, we must understand that when Jesus says dogs, the more literal translation can be little dog. And it's considered by many biblical scholars that it's a playful, enduring, endearing term, not a dismissive, cold-hearted name. And so this, and this Canaanite mother, she picks up on it. And perhaps she hears the sweetness in being called a little puppy. Because, and let's be honest, even if you don't like dogs or cats, puppies and kittens, they're pretty adorable. (laughs) I don't like cats, and kittens are, you know, but. And so we hear this back and forth. And some families, teasing and bantering is just part of the time spent at the dinner table. My poor daughter, Abigail, and I did ask her for permission to share this. My poor daughter has me, has my father-in-law, her nano, her uncles, who tease her perhaps too much. However, in the last year, she has become quite good at returning fire. <laughs> and if, you're, if you don't know the situation, you would think that she is being disrespectful. And a few times I've had to stop and like, oh, whoa, you know, but that's not her intention. She's just returning that playful back and forth that we, in our family, the thing we do. There's a relationship there. And so our Canaanite mother, who I would venture is, it, venture it here is where she gets a sense of hope in that back and forth. And she picks up on it and she returns it. Yes, even little puppies get crumbs that fall on the floor. You see, her hope is she is finally hurt. There's no longer a silence. Now she, now she hasn't had her request granted, but she has been hurt. 
Her hope is that, is that desire of, I'm not sure how I wrote that. Her hope is in being heard by God. The son of David, whom she likely, again, doesn't know much about, has heard her. He heard her when her own so-called God of healing, Eshmun, did not. Jesus heard her lament, her plea. You see, when we feel God is not hearing us, we can bring our lament to him. When God is silent, let us bring forth our lament to him. Let us bring forth our lament and cross those two hot wires of the problem and the promise. Our Canaanite mother pleads with Jesus at the very start of this passage, bringing forth the problem. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Jesus knew that. He knew that beforehand. Just like he knows our situations, whatever they might be, he knows our desperate need. And so when God is silent, let us bring the problem to him again. Jesus reminds us in Luke 18, if he continues to be silent, keep coming to him like the persistent widow who's seeking justice from the oppressor. Pursue him who first pursued you when you did not want to know anything about him. Be like Jacob who wrestled with the Lord in order to receive that blessing. Or again, like our Canaanite mother who refused to be brushed off, refused to take the cold shoulder and knelt at the feet of the promise. Our Canaanite mother reminds us that as we come to God, bringing our problem, we come looking towards his promise. That's part of the lament. It's not just the problem. It's not about just complaints, but it's also leaning into the promise. As was mentioned before, she didn't know the fullness of who the son of David was, but she had a hope in a few things she had heard. This rabbi heals this rabbi casts out demons. This rabbi talks to women and foreigners. Perhaps this rabbi will heal my daughter. We, as the body of Christ, we have the whole counsel of Scripture to draw from, to know in a fuller sense than she, who Jesus is. We know him as redeemer and friend. We know him as the great shepherd. We know him as the incarnate word. We know him as our brother. Thanks be to God is correct. Clearly, I could go on and on. But in knowing these things, we know the promises. So when God is silent, let us bring forth the promise in our lament to him. When we are in that desperate place, we have the benefit of the lament. We can lament towards God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. A lament that is not hope, a hopeless complaint, but a plea to God with an eye looking backwards and forward. To quote Paul Miller one more time, when you lament, you live simultaneously in the past, present, and future. A lament connects God's past promise with my present chaos, hoping for a better future. When God is silent, we bring forth our lament to him again and again. We learn from the Canaanite woman and her desperate faith that our hope is in the Lord. When we feel he does not hear no, he hears. Whether he answers as we hope, well, that's a different story. That's a different thing and another sermon for another day. But know his love for you is so deep that he has given you his son for your salvation and restoration. And if he would do that while we were still enemies with him, know his care for you. Second, we learn. Your faith is a relationship with Christ Jesus. Much like the woman's banter with the Lord, so we must approach him boldly, persistently, and dare I say playfully, as we approach him as children, as brothers and sisters of our Redeemer, Christ Jesus. Now, that woman didn't know what we know today, but she came boldly. How much more, and with much more boldness, should we come to him who is our father, the truest and most perfect father? She didn't know Jesus as brother, though she had heard he was the fabled son of David. 
We, however, know him better. We can come to him as brother, with the, which the author of the Hebrews says, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, he who sanctifies being Jesus and those sanctified are us, have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Jesus is not ashamed to call you a brother or a sister. He is not ashamed of you. Hallelujah. So come boldly with your promises. Come with your problems. Come resting in the promise. And one of the greatest promises, and you'll if I end up getting to you know, preach every so often here, you're going to hear this passage a number of times because it is so meaningful, so powerful. One of the greatest promises is this. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God." He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. And I'll stop there. But that is the promise. And our hope, when God doesn't answer your prayers, our hope is the fact that he will dwell with us one day. And he will wipe those tears from your eyes. He will heal this sin-torn world. Those are just six verses that I read. But what hope they provide for desperate people. And we can rely on a God who never fades or fails. And perhaps as we cross those wires of the promise and the problem, we, and we wait. And we wait, we listen for God to break the silence. And as we wait, perhaps we will hear what the Lord told the Canaanite woman when he spoke directly to her. A woman, great is your faith. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask that you enable us to be able to wait in the silence because it is so hard. Let us rest in the promises that you have given us. And so although we wait wondering what you are doing in this world at times, let us wait as we rest on the promise that you have provided us in your word. And use that to strengthen us that we might continually come to you pleading our case. And in your good time and good fatherly love, we do ask that you answer. And may we accept that, however it might be, because we trust in that promise. We pray all this in the founder and perfecter of our faith, in Christ's name, amen. We stand as we respond uh, by saying uh, what we believe in together, the Nicene Creed. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and on our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. 
For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death, then was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and life of the world. Please sit or kneel for the prayer of the people. the church, and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Foley Beach, our archbishop, and his wife, Allison. Ken Ross, our bishop, and his wife, Sally. Father Michael, our pastor, and his wife, Heather Beth. Chaplain Ed and his wife Mariah, Marge, our deacon, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, that we may, by our lives and doctrine, set forth God's true and lively word. Today we pray for our sister church, Church of the Advent in Denver, their pastor Jordan Kologi and his wife Jenny. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, that they may remain undaunted in their tasks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, especially in Bangladesh, that they may be strengthened in their will to follow you as the kingdom of God is advanced. We also pray today for the election in Guatemala, this crucial presidential election which will happen today to bring justice to this nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially for the president, the vice president, the governor of the state of Wyoming, the mayor of Cheyenne, that they may execute the duties of their office in safety and wisdom with their eyes firmly fixed on you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Especially we ask for healing for Heather Beth, for Janelle, for Barbara, Marge, Carol, Pat, for Karen Vensel, for Carrie, and for Casey. And we ask, Lord, for comfort, wisdom, strength, and fellowship for Lucille and for Chrissy, Joey, Lily and baby Jay. We pray for the needs of the members of this congregation not here with us today, and that all members are delivered from hardness of heart to show forth your glory in all that we do. For those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, please lead them back to your loving embrace, that they may receive the truth of the gospel, 
for those in harm's way, either natural or man-made, that they may find respite and restoration. Are there others that the congregation wishes to pray for? Mm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, especially Ramiro, in thanksgiving let us pray and let us lift up for support Ramiro's family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the men and women in public service who keep us safe and secure, for our freedom to worship you, being part of the family of Gathcon, the Anglican Church in North America, and the Diocese of the Rocky Mountains. And we pray for those who are called to missionary work, especially abroad. And Father, we also lift up to you Scott Weiner, Brent's brother. We pray that as he faces surgery for skin cancer, that you will give him strength and peace and guide the doctors, Lord. Are there other words of thanksgiving where God has met your needs this past week? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God healing as able. Most merciful God, we confess that, that we, we have, have sinned, sinned against you in thought, thought word, and, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The saying is trustworthy and deserve a full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And if anyone, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please greet one another in the sign of peace. Turn my mic off because <laughs> I heard of some feedback and I was like, maybe I should turn it off. But then I don't know if I got it. All right.
pieces works too. Um, go, oh, oh, go ahead and give us an offering, offertory sentence. <laughs> Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O oh Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O oh Lord. Let, let's, uh, let's turn in our hymnals to hymn number 271, hymn 271.
is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. And of your own have we given you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of the faith. <laughs> celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, 
and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him and with him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray. In giving of thanks. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
among us. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. All right, this last song isn't in our hymnal, but that's okay. Let's just stand amazed in his presence and sing to Jesus the Nazarene. Rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be Thank to God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.